A few weeks ago, I decided to make an old school arcade game for my BBC microcomputer. In the 80s, most computers came with BASIC, which was slow but easy to use. I used the same BASIC and graphics capabilities from back in the day to write a shoot 'em up game but using vector graphics, something that's rarely done because it's quite inefficient. So why am I doing it? Well, because I wanted to. And today I'm freed from the speed and memory restrictions of the old machines thanks to a Pi-based internal coprocessor. Now I've got a basic, basic game that I'm quite pleased with. But I can make it better. Much, much better. I used vector graphics so I could write my game in BASIC without knowing how the screen memory was arranged. But I needed to store how things would be drawn using a graphics definition structure. For each individual item in the game, I needed a structure to store entity information, which stores type, position and points to a graphics definition so it knows where and how to draw itself. A game loop manages these entities and other things like scores and lives. To use my structures, I have some general functions and procedures. There are functions to construct graphics definitions and draw them on a screen. For each entity, we have procedures to initialize, move them, iterate over a collection in memory, and to detect collisions. There's a program loop that runs until the program is closed. An outer game loop runs while the player has lives left. The inner game loop runs while the player is alive. And this is where the fun stuff happens. Rather. We show the score and lives left, move and draw aliens, move and draw bombs and bullets, handle user input, draw the player's rocket, and check for collisions. And all of this is written in good old BBC Basic from the 1980s. This is where we got to last time. And while I'm pleased with how it's gone so far, when I compare it to a commercial game from back in the day, it seems a bit flat. I think one of the reasons for that is that each entity on the screen is just one colour. So the first improvement I'm making is to allow my graphics to change drawing colour within the definition. I'm simply adding a colour change alongside the move and draw instructions. This also means we don't need to store colour as part of the entity structure anymore. Here's an example in the function to define our alien image. We set an initial colour, then change it twice for detail in the face. While I'm here, I'm also going to simplify the player's rocket design because it's a bit overcomplicated, and change the colour palette to something much brighter. And this is the result of our efforts so far. I've also added a high score display and livened up the start screen with a bit more colour. To create even more depth, I'm also adding a simple multicolour scrolling star field as a background. There's a function to generate a random selection of stars called at startup, and a procedure to move, colour and plot the stars called in the game loop. Ideally we only want to redraw things when they move, so to avoid having to redraw the rocket if it's still, we don't show stars at the bottom of the screen. Otherwise, they'll eat into the rocket as they scroll. The other aspect of my game that seems flat is the sound. In my first cut, I've just used simple beeps on certain events. I use the white noise channel for explosions, but there's not much else of interest. BBC Basic gives us an envelope command that was designed to be used with the sound chip and allows us to shape sounds in terms of frequency and amplitude. We can turn a beep into a bong by shaping the ADSR profile. We can also vary the frequency over three periods to create a siren effect. The envelopes can be applied to our existing sound effects to turn them into something a bit more interesting. Having just one design of Alien is a little bit boring, so I've added a second. It's in a similar style, but clearly different. 
I've also only got one route that the aliens take from the top left. To add some variety, I'll alternate the alien design and mirror the route so it comes from the top right on every other wave. To do this, we'll have to take a look at how we manage all the aliens in the game loop. Part of that process is to spawn a new wave of aliens when there are none left on the screen. To control that, we need to store three values. The number of aliens we have in the next wave, the number of aliens left to spawn in the current wave, and the number of live aliens on the screen right now. The logic says that when we have no live aliens left on screen, and we don't have aliens left to spawn, then start spawning a wave by setting alien spawn size equal to the next wave size, and increase the size for the following wave. While we have aliens left to spawn in this wave, start a new alien entity and reduce the spawn count until it's zero. At that point, our wave is all created. It's this start a new alien part that we'll use to alternate our alien design and flight path. In the start alien procedure, we can pass alien type as a parameter. We set the image definition to use based on the alien type and the flight path horizontal start position too. We then initialize the alien entity passing image, position and type information. In the game loop, we call start alien, passing in an alternate alien type index based on the next wave size. When we come to the regular update of each alien's position on screen, we use the path side that we set when we initialize the alien entity to apply either a positive or negative horizontal position change, so we effectively create a mirror image flight path. To take it even further, after wave 21, I randomize which route each individual alien takes. I want to introduce a reward system, so sometimes when an alien is hit, it releases a bonus object the player can collect. So I got out my trusty squared pad and started playing with ideas. This is my design for the bonus object, and here is the code to create the image definition. To understand how this will work, we need to review how the player interacts with aliens. While an alien is alive, it has a state of 20. When it gets hit, its state changes to 19, the alien explode state, and its image now points to the explode graphic. The alien state starts to count down, so the explosion stays on screen for a while. When the state gets to 10, bonus time, we decide if we want to drop a bonus object, and if we do, we call the drop bonus procedure to initialize a bonus entity. The update bonus procedure is called in the game loop and manages the entity on screen. The alien state continues to count down until it reaches zero and the explosion is cleared. The update bonus procedure continues to move the bonus entity until it drops off the screen or collides with the player. If a collision is detected, a random reward is applied, a bonus life or a timed period of enhanced weapons or a shield. The bonus mode is set and if it's a timed reward, bonus count is also set. In the game loop, we show a text description of the bonus mode and a countdown in seconds until the countdown reaches zero when we reset the bonus mode. The drop bonus procedure initializes a bonus entity. The update bonus procedure checks that the object is still active and on screen, then moves it down and test for a collision with the player. If the player has collected the bonus, then a random bonus mode is assigned, and if it's a timed feature, then the bonus countdown is also set. Once collected, the bonus message is set and the entity is reset so we can drop another one later. We've introduced a lot of new features into the code. That's inevitably resulted in some additional work in the inner game loop. We need to make a regular call to draw and scroll the starfield background, we have to handle bonus messages and the countdown timer. And if the player has collected a bonus feature, we need to implement that behavior. 
It's been quite a bit of work, but I think the improvement over my first version is huge. Because we're using vector graphics, we have an opportunity to introduce transformations to how we draw things. You may have noticed earlier that there's another file on my drive. So let's take a look at what it contains. In our existing code, we have a function to draw each part of an image. If we take a quick look at that, you can see I've just added some simple perspective code that gets applied to every drawn entity. 
That's all I had to do to make my game more 3D. It's only taken me 40 years and an ARM co-processor to achieve my goal of writing a decent game for my BBC Micro. Yes, I'm cheating by using relatively modern technology under the covers, hmm. but it still uses the original Mode 1 4 colour graphics and BBC Basic, so I'm happy I've stuck to my own rules. Oh. The main thing is that it's been fun to do and I genuinely enjoy playing the game, although I may need to invest in a joystick, otherwise my return key might not survive too long. I'll put the code on my website, www.pixelfandango.com, just go to the retro video bit and scroll down. I'm sure you'll find it. Also, check out the other stuff on the website, including Hexplan X and my other videos on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Cheers. <laughs>